We will be talking about eBPF for creating least privileged policies today. Uh, my name is Natalia. I'm the product lead for runtime security at Isovalent, which is now part of Cisco. And here is with me John, who is the who is a Cilium maintainer, Tetragon, and technical lead for basically everything that we will be talking about it today. So a little bit about the agenda. So I will talk uh, first about the motivation, like what was the main purpose behind this talk, which is securing cloud, securing cloud native applications. Then we will move into the principle of least privileged, like why is it so hard to create least privileged policies on Kubernetes environment, and why is it so powerful if you actually achieve that. And then John will talk about it, talk about eBPF and some ideas like how one could create least privileged, least privileged policies. And then in the end, we will do a little bit of demo. So first of all, the motivation. So let's take a step back and just look at this picture. This is the CNCF landscape. So these are all the tools and then services that makes up the Kubernetes ecosystem. So if you are a Kubernetes operator or someone from the platform team, you actually know like how much effort and time to take uh, to build a Kubernetes environment, and that you, after that you actually need to secure it. But the good news is that different workloads and services have different risks because they are doing different tasks. So if you prioritize your focus to only allow uh, the tasks that a workload should do, and basically deny everything else, that, that can be a good start. So we can actually start to build up like least privileged policies. So what is actually the principle of least privilege? So by definition, it states that a subject should be given only those privileges needed for it to complete its task. And then if a subject doesn't need an access right, well, the subject should not have that right. So for example, if you have like a Kafka application in a Kubernetes environment, you know that it only should run Java, it should never shell out to the node, it should never make any unexpected network connection, and it also should never have like Opsys admin. But creating least privileged, least privileged policies in Kubernetes environment, it's hard. So why is it actually hard? So first of all, you actually need to understand like what least privileged mean for a Kubernetes workload. So what is the baseline behavior? Like what is the identity that we are talking about? Like is it a Kubernetes workload, a binary, a user, and so on? And then once you identify that identity, like what are the binaries that are allowed to execute? Like what network connections are allowed to be made? What files can be accessed? What capabilities can the workload have? And then what Linux namespaces can the workload access? And then, so this is like a very simple example of, um, of a Kubernetes workload, which is just Kafka. So these are all the processes that were executed during the initial startup. So on the top, you can actually system D, and then you can see that it reached out to container D, which was the runtime, and then container D later started, um, started the container, and then later in the tree, you can actually see the, the Docker entry point best script, which uh, started Java. So these processes are like good known processes, and then this can act as like a baseline behavior. And then based on this baseline behavior, you can actually start to create um, least privileged policies. But it's also hard because you need, to, you need to do it at scale, right? So we are talking about thousands of nodes, thousands of pods, like multiple namespaces, multiple clusters, even multiple cloud providers. And then additionally, you have like external fleets, like standalone VMs. And then this is just a simple screenshot about the cluster that we scaled, which can be, I don't know, like 200 nodes per day up to 1,000 nodes per day. And then it's also hard because you just have a lot of data. Like you have Kubernetes identities, pod labels, namespaces. You have all the runtime information, the binaries, the parent binaries, the digest process capabilities, Linux namespaces, system calls, or the network information, both on the S3 f or on the network socket side, and then all the, all the S7 information, like DNS, HTTP, TLS. And then you have all the file access information, like read, write, execute, delete, rename, and so on. 
So if you take up all this information, this can lead to like millions of events, even just for like a given binary um, at scale. And then lastly, we will be talking about eBPF today. So both the least privileged principle and the policies actually need to cross a conceptual gap. So eBPF, it's like Linux kernel technology. It lives down in the kernel and then all of its tooling as well. So he, there you have like C groups and namespaces, and then you have the Linux operating system which runs on top of hardware. But this is just not what a Kubernetes operator or a, or a platform team would look at. They are looking at like Kubernetes identity aware context, so clusters, namespaces, pod labels. So this privilege actually like needs to cross this gap, like what the Linux kernel knows about and then what, for example, a SecOps team are looking at. But the good news is that if you solve all of this, and then you actually manage to create your security posture based on least priv privileged policies, then it can be super powerful because many of the CVs could have been enforced or will be enforced regardless of their category. So I listed a couple of examples here. Uh, one CV category can be, for example, the, uh, the Linux kernel, where recently there was a vulnerability in the NetFilter net feature, which allowed the attacker to achieve like local privilege escalation. Or the second category could be like container runtimes, and then we all know about the runc vulnerability, which was due to like leaked file descriptors and allowed the attacker to access the host file system. Or the last one could be like demons and services, where there was a, a backdoor in the lib uh, library, which was used by a certain open, open SSH version, and then enable the attacker to um, remote code execution. So if you create like least privileged policies, which allow only certain binaries and their associated hashes to run in a workload, like many of these could have been enforced or the impact could have been limited. And then John will talk a little bit about more how it could have been achieved with ABPF. Perfect, thanks. Thanks, Natalia. So I hope um, Natalia kind of convinced you that there's a, if we can precisely state what a program is going to do, what files it's going to open, what uh, network connections it's going to make, what execs it's going to make. If we can do all of that, we can create a very tightly, um, a very sick policy that, that binds that container or that pod or that application to just, just that set of things. And, and then the intent will be that CVEs that sort of bounce outside of that with path traversals or other modes are going to be sort of naturally blocked because they're outside of the normal scope of the application. Um, of course, this is, you know, BPF. Uh, conference, so you know, BPF is our tool of choice here, for all of the normal reasons that we talk about, and sort of, I'll just skip through this for the, in the interest of time. But on top of BPF, we built a tool called Tetragon, and, and Tetragon is interesting for a couple reasons. Um, for this talk, the p really interesting piece is that it allows you to hook any kernel function um, that you can define in the policy. So there's no predefined list of set of functions that the BPF supports. It has like an engine that runs, um, and you get to tell it what functions to hook, and then build filters on top of that. So you can say, um, if this syscall is ha happens with uh, these args, I want to block that operation. Or if this file operation happens, um, I want to, uh, with these file names, I want to block that. And so that's how we can sort of Imagine building this policy that tightly binds the application. Uh, so, and it also has pod labels and binds for applications and binary names and digests of the binaries. So you can really drill into the pod and say this, um, this process is allowed to open these files. It's allowed to do these network connects and it's allowed to spawn other execs and only that set and nothing else. So that's why what we think is one of the powerful pieces of Tetragon. Now, the problem that, that Natalia alluded to is really once you deploy this thing to your network, a bunch of clusters, a bunch of uh, cloud compute, and maybe some on-prem systems, you might have thousands of thousands of nodes running. And if all of those thousands of nodes are generating every network connection, every file connection to build this model, you're going to have lots and lots of data. Um, 
So you can do something and fil start filtering at the different layers, but if you really want to model, you can't filter fi all the file operations, for example, right? Because you, you want to see all the opens so that you can build that model, or you want to get all the network connections so you can build the network model. Um, and so um, kind of converse to the other model where we have where we say, here are known bad behaviors. We can push those bad behavior filters into the network. Say, I know what a path traversal looks like. I know what the CVE does, so I can push that filter directly down. In this model, we really want to observe everything to start with and then build that model and, and sort of enforce it after that. Um, the other problem with these filters is depending the kind of further out you get from BPF, the more easier it is to filter sort of at globally, global levels or node levels, but it becomes costly, costly, right? The, every time you get an event, you have to wake up the user space agent. You run, you're going to wake it up. You're going to use CPU. You're going to use memory. You could push these a millions and millions of events into a database, um, but now you'll have a, a data storage problem. You might be storing terabytes of data a day. And it really doesn't take that much data or that many events to get to terabytes of data when you have thousands of nodes. Just a quick calculation. If you do one gigabit per node, you have 100 nodes per cluster, 10 clusters, you're already at one terabyte a day. Right? And that's not a, that's a good sized cluster, but we see clusters that are even bigger than this. Right? Um, and a terabyte of day might become 10 terabytes a day or 100 terabytes a day. And now you're really looking at a very large data lake um, and lots and lots of events in that data lake. So the sort of prototype that we're looking at and what we do to solve this problem is rather than push every file event or every network event into the cluster's data lake, into user space, so that we're not using CPU usage on the host, it so kind of went the other way and said, let's really build out those filters on BPF, push everything into BPF. What if you don't need to wake up an agent? What if you don't even need an agent for the BPF side? What if you build that model directly in the OS? And at that point, your kernel will know this application has these network connections, this application has these files. Now you've got to really beef up the BPF side to do this. Um, but that's what Natalia will show in the demo here in a, in a second. And what we did is once we've done that, we can build this tooling around here to show kind of this is just my my uh, silly kernel developer's view of the world, right? An ASCII, ASCII dump from a command line tool. Um, Natalia will show you the prettier version of this. But um, what you see is that we can dump the map directly, and you can get a process tree directly in BPF map. You know, the kernel knows all the network connections. It knows all the files. And the really nice thing about this is once you have that model, you can flip it to enforce. Say, so if I see something new, don't allow it. And that's, a, I think, a really powerful notion of pushing all of this back to BPF. So it's in line. You're not waking up the agent. If the agent goes down and comes back up, it's not really that important because all of the, all of the stuff is in the kernel that you care about. It becomes a kind of core service of your operating system. And um, the other kind of fallout of this is we no longer have to pull all of these agents in the network. So now, rather than pushing data out at some, every time we get an event, the OS is going to collect all the data. And when we want to, we can kind of tune that knob. How, how uh, responsive do you want to be? Do you want to get an event every second? Then you can query the node every second. Do you not need that sort of um, responsiveness? Maybe every minute is fine. Maybe every five minutes is fine. Maybe every 30 minutes is fine. And you can scale that, um, that model with the sort of size of your network and the cost that you want to um, kind of incur. Um, and so with that, I'll just. Um, Reiterate the really valuable piece is now we push everything into BPF. The uh, sort of security model and application model become part of the kernel and part of the OS. Our agent is just there to sort of win as needed, pull that model up and put it in, into, uh, into a user space uh, database. And uh, I'll let Natalia give you the demo. All right, so demo time. I will just quickly introduce the test environment. Um, we use an AWS cluster with 10 nodes. These nodes are running Amazon Linux with a 6.1 kernel. Tetragon is running on those nodes as a daemon set. And I also deployed a demo application. It's an Astral Mishop demo from the Open Telemetry repository. So this is basically like 20 microservices running on the Hotel Demo Kubernetes namespace. And then basically Tetragon is observing all these like runtime security events. 
we used Vector as a log forwarding system, and then we exported all the data to Splunk Cloud. So the first step uh, during this demo, basically, observe the runtime security events. The second is like export it to a log file, which is like tetragon.log on each node. And then basically, uh, the third step is to forward it to a CM, which will be Splunk. And then after that, on the Splunk side, we actually created dashboards, with, which would show like what binaries have been executed during the uh, workload startup. And then, for example, what network connections have been made. So this can act as like a good uh, baseline behavior for the application. And then based on that, we will recommend like baseline policies, which is just a YAML. Like this can act as a least privileged, least privileged policy. And then after that, we apply those policies to the cluster. And then as a last step, I just did a very simple um, sensitive data exfiltration uh, in one of the workloads. And then basically, um, after these operations, you could see all the policy violations that would show up on the, on the dashboard. So I pre-recorded the demo, and then I will try to play the video. Um, if someone is interested uh, later, we can show you the live demo at our booth. <laughs> 